VR is potentially the biggest transformation in our relationship with technology, at least since the personal computer, and possibly much more. It's the completion of a path that started with the invention of language and drawing and continued with writing, printing, telephony, radios, radio movies, television, and computer games. VR will finally allow us to interact with the information in the way we're built to interact with reality. But there is no inevitability to how that happens, how long it takes, or how it alters our lives. VR is coming, but the path it takes depends on the actions of a few thousand key people, potentially including you. That may be hard to believe, but I'm completely serious. Working on VR is probably the closest any of us will ever come to living in a science fiction novel. Having said that, this seems like a good time at which to insert the official most famous VR photo ever. Partly because this happens to be my cousin, Sally Rosenthal. <laughs> but also to remind ourselves of how often VR has been touted to take off in the past and how consistently that has failed. Why is it going to be different this time? Let's start with what Chris Anderson called the peace dividend of the smartphone war. Good enough VR requires a sizable number of aspects to be above the bar simultaneously. If even one isn't good enough, the experience just won't come together. These aspects include optics, calibration, ergonomics, rendering, and optical tracking, all of which are tractable for small teams with relatively modest budgets. But there's also a need for small, lightweight, high-resolution screens, along with tiny, accurate, high-frequency gyroscopes and accelerometers, and those are definitely not tractable without very considerable resources. No one has ever been willing to spend billions of dollars to develop those technologies just to find out if there was a VR market, but many companies have been willing to spend that kind of money in order to develop the smartphone market. Similarly, development of GPUs, powerful enough to handle the warping needed to correct for fisheye lenses, and to handle the heavy rendering demands of VR, happened courtesy of the game industry. And tiny, inexpensive cameras were likewise developed for other purposes. The second reason is that consumer VR good enough to be broadly successful is clearly within reach. The DK2 is a big step down that path, but there's a lot more going on right now in both VR and AR, which share a lot of the same technology. There's a full-on race to establish the next big platform, be it AR or VR, and a, a, a tremendous amount of horsepower is being brought to bear on optics, tracking, and small displays. VR-related technology is driving forward, and it won't be long before we have an existence proof for consumer VR. Once great consumer VR is shown to be possible and is shipping in quantity, many companies, both hardware and software, are suddenly going to become believers. Increased competition and investment in VR will result in more innovation and better VR experiences, which will lead to broader uptake, which will lead to more investment, resulting in a virtuous cycle, just as happened with smartphones. All it will take to kick this off is consumer VR hardware enough, good enough to spur widespread adoption, and we're almost there. And then, of course, there is Facebook's $2 billion acquisition of Oculus, which guarantees that VR is going to get the resources and the runway that it needs to prove itself. So VR will have plenty of time and resources, can leverage work done for cell phones and other industries, is right on the verge of being technically good enough, and will kick off a virtuous cycle once it starts to be successful. VR drives the human perceptual system in the way it's built to be driven. As a result, VR can produce experiences that feel deeply real, and that will result in a fundamental change in the way we interact with technology. What can now work is understanding the key cues and driving enough parts of the perceptual system from the outside, through the eyes, ears, skin, and so on, to create experiences that induce presence, the sense that you actually are someplace, rather than just looking at a picture of someplace. It's just barely possible right now, but that's enough. Using VR to drive the perceptual system directly is far more revolutionary than it seems. It's not just pasting up bigger and better images, like a 360-degree IMAX theater. It's a difference of kind. Traditional media present images and sounds that are descriptions of experiences. Done properly, VR presents experiences directly in the way that our bodies have evolved to accept information. The bottom line is that VR isn't just another platform, because it's information driving the perceptual system the way it's built to be driven. It's an entirely different and more powerful way to interface with information and computers than we're used to. And in a very real sense, it's the final platform 
the one that wraps our senses and will ultimately be able to deliver any experience that we're capable of having. Okay, you may or may not be convinced, but it's my belief that now that VR is technically doable, economically feasible, and capable of driving the human perceptual system convincingly enough to transport you to virtual worlds, in all likelihood, VR will take off in a big way over the upcoming years. This is like when John and I started on Quake, but on steroids. Pretty much everything still needs to be figured out. The killer app for VR hasn't been created yet. Likewise, VR art, animation, and game design are ripe for invention. Even the mechanics of VR have yet to be invented. I remember when John came up with mouse look, and no one knew which way it should move your viewpoint. Strafing, HUDs, movement speeds, everything that had to be figured out for FPSs will have to be figured out again for VR, and much, much more. Consider graphics. Right now, graphics is a mature area featuring steady but incremental improvement. The graph of effort and sophistication in versus perceived result out over time looks something like this. VR is going to do this to that curve. The reason that graphics is going to have to up its game in a hurry is that because VR engages so much more of the perceptual system than a monitor does, it's held to a much higher standard. Parallax, accurate positioning, wide field of view, and stereo vision together provide vastly more information to the perceptual system, which responds very strongly to VR done right, and complains just as strongly about VR that isn't quite right. And the trick is that right now, no one knows what it is that will make VR graphics great, and many of the tried and true rules of screen graphics no longer apply in VR. For example, Aliasing is much worse in VR because the aliasing mismatches between the two eyes introduce stereo disparity, which is far more apparent and disturbing than mere jaggies on a screen. This is particularly noticeable with specular highlights. Similarly, faceting is much easier to see, so geometric detail becomes more important. All the more so because tricks used to fake geometric detail often look laughably wrong. Texture maps sometimes work, but sometimes look like painted plywood, and bump map surfaces simply don't look right. What all this means is that we're all going to have to invent new rendering, art, and animation approaches that work well in VR and rethink tool pipelines and, eventually, GPU architectures to match. For a while, graphics will be the Wild West again as a slew of experiments get run to figure out the new graphics sweet spots for the VR world. And it's not going to stop there. Consider how technology enabled the evolution of first-person shooters over time. Fast enough CPUs enabled Wolfenstein 3D. Faster CPUs and peer-to-peer -peer networking enabled Doom. Still faster CPUs and the internet enabled Quake. And ever more powerful GPUs enabled Quake 2 and its successors. VR is going to be like that. Given the right combination of hardware and software, every aspect of VR will improve hugely over time. Of course, the VR platform isn't going to advance on its own. Someone has to make that happen. That someone is Oculus Research. We're putting together a broad mix of researchers, engineers, and programmers to form the first complete, well-funded VR research team in close to 20 years. We have the full backing of Oculus and Facebook for doing the deep, long-term work needed to make VR as good as it can be. Our mission is to keep advancing the VR platform so that you can develop new, great VR experiences on top of it. And we're fully aware that VR is more than just Oculus. We'll be publishing our findings and working with university researchers so the whole VR community can grow and move forward. So let's take a quick look at some of the ways in which we think we and others can make VR much better over time. Bear in mind, though, that this is research, so that there are no guarantees. Improving visual quality is the obvious place to start. The Rift DK2's resolution is about a megapixel per eye, spread over a field of view of 100 degrees, which means that the pixel density is very low indeed. Less, in fact, than the original Quake running on a monitor at 320 by 200 resolution. To get the same pixel density per degree as a modern desktop monitor, you'd need more than 50 times as many pixels, something on the order of 8K by 8K per eye. Achieving retinal resolution would require somewhere in the neighborhood of 16K by 16K. And that's with a 100 degree field of view. The full dynamic field of view of the human eye is on the order of 200 by 150 degrees, taking us to something like 32K by 24K resolution <laughs> per eye. <clears throat> <laughs> that means that eye tracking will almost certainly be a part of the future of VR. 
we wouldn't actually draw anything close to 32K by 24K pixels. We take advantage of the steep drop in resolution away from the fovea, the tiny high resolution area of the retina, to render only as much resolution as the eye can detect. But, of course, we'd need to know where the fovea was pointed every frame, which means we'll need to integrate eye tracking with new display, optics, GPU, and rendering technology in order to make a truly great VR visual experience possible. We'll also be looking at depth of field. In order to explain this, let me define a couple of terms. The word vergence refers to how the eyes cross to provide stereo vision. The, more cro the closer the object of interest, the more cross the eyes need to be. Accommodation, on the other hand, refers to how the lens of the eye deforms to allow you to focus at different distances. <clears throat> Most existing head-mounted displays support stereo images that allow for correct vergence, but all head-mounted displays that I'm aware of support only one focal depth for all objects in a scene, usually placing everything at near-infinite focal depth. Immersion in a scene in which all objects are accommodated at infinity is not perceptually ideal because the accommodation and vergence reflexes are linked. The lack of proper depth of field can cause discomfort, can prevent stereo fusion, and may make VR feel subtly less real. There are several possible ways in which this might be addressed, but one thing they all have in common is that they require new hardware and significant changes to the rendering model. Once the visuals are good enough, Many other areas take on new importance in VR, including tracking, audio propagation and spatialization, input, user experience, haptics, and perceptual psychology. I wish I had time today to talk about the tremendous potential for all those areas in VR. But one particularly exciting area is scene capture and reconstruction. VR is going to need a great deal of realistic content, and the most promising base for that is deconstructing and reconstructing the real world. Over time, this will evolve to incorporate dynamic elements, such as weather, lighting, scraps of paper blowing in the wind, cars, and, of course, people. That brings us to what I think will be the core of VR. Once we have virtual places to be in, we'll want to see ourselves and others in that space. Sensors that can capture the interpersonal cues humans key off of, head pose, eye movement, facial expression, hand gesture, body posture and movement, and then map them onto avatars in real time will enable social interaction in these virtual spaces. Bell Labs used to talk about enabling any two people on the face of the Earth to communicate, a powerful vision that has pretty much come true. Now imagine anyone on the face of the Earth being able to be anywhere with anyone doing anything whenever they want. Humans are highly social creatures. And I believe that sharing virtual spaces with other people will ultimately be the most powerful and widely used aspect of VR. VR is about driving the perceptual system. The more of it, the better. So eventually, it will involve all the senses. Audio, tactile, balance, kinesthetic, maybe even smell and taste. The entire body will become the sensor, not just the eyes. And the display will consist of not just pixels, but of everything that drives perception. VR also includes the other part of the perceptual loop, interaction as well as sensing. So it will include the ability to manipulate the virtual world as well. Over time, VR will wrap more and more of our perceptual system and will truly become a personalized alternate reality. It'll be many years before that transformation is complete, but VR is already changing what is possible, just as new hardware long ago enabled mist, doom, and quake. Soon there will be VR games, apps, and experiences that will revolutionize the way we interact with information and with each other. Right now, we're at the very beginning of the VR revolution, and ahead of us lies a long, incredibly exciting time of groundbreaking research and development by smart, talented people, people like you. At Oculus, we're all in on building the VR platform, but that's only part of the picture. It takes a whole community working on top of that platform to make VR happen. This is what it looks like when opportunity knocks. I hope you'll take this rare chance to shape the future and come along on the adventure of a lifetime as we make science fiction real. Thank you. VR opens up a whole new universe of possibilities, and once you've experienced it, it's obvious that it's going to change the world in a big way. And the truly amazing part is that we've barely started down the path toward what VR is capable of. Decades of innovation, 
and new experiences lie before us. Today, I'm going to talk to you about what we at Oculus Research see as the core challenges of VR, the ones that are the keys to unlocking the future. Imagine being able to feel and manipulate virtual objects. Imagine being able to bring real objects into the virtual world to create mixed reality. Imagine talking to someone and believing that their avatar was really them, right down to the way they smile and gesture, and then feeling the vibrations as they set their soda can down on the table. And imagine feeling like you've slipped on magic glasses that reveal another world that's as vivid and believable as this one. All of those experiences, and many more, have the potential to become real in the next five to 10 years. And as they do, we will all gain a new superpower, the ability to build our own personal and shared realities. My own dream is to jump into a personal workspace configured however I want, 10 giant monitors, or a huge hologram, or flaming letters in the sky, then be able with a click to switch to another workspace set up for something else, maybe a room full of books open to where I last left them, or a half-completed model of a prototype, or an endless plane of virtual whiteboards covered with my notes. Coworkers could teleport in to look over my shoulder or sit and talk, and when I want to relax, friends could stop by to chat or play chess. Your dream is probably different. Maybe it's a sculpting studio, or an animation lab, or a game design space, or something else entirely. Whatever it is, VR has the potential to bring it to life. It would be amazingly cool to be able to do all that. But it's not going to happen on its own. Getting to the next level of VR is going to require coordinated advances in more than a dozen different technologies. Today, I'm going to map out the areas that we think are key to the future of VR, and then I'll talk a bit about how we're working to bring that future about. The future of VR will be built on three pillars. Driving the human perceptual system, sensing and reconstructing the local state of the real world, and interaction. I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of what they are, where they stand, and how they can get better. I'll only have time to skim across some of the high points, but that should be enough to give you a sense of the astonishing breadth and depth of the challenges involved in moving VR forward. The better we can drive the perceptual system, the better the VR experience. Ideally, that means driving the five traditional senses plus one more. If we could drive these six senses perfectly, then VR would be indistinguishable from the real world. Let's look at how close we are in each of these areas and how we might get closer. Let's start with taste. While it's not hard to imagine delivery systems for taste, it is hard to imagine ones that people would actually be willing to use. <laughs> also, virtual food requires proper haptics and aroma for chewing and swallowing, and there's no prospect of getting those right anytime soon. Finally, taste is much less generally useful than the other senses. So this is the one sense that I'm happy to leave to future VR researchers. <laughs> Smell has powerful memory and emotional associations, but it's surprisingly complicated. You'd think all it would take to produce convincing smells would be to release the correct odor molecules near the nose. But in fact, odors in the real world don't simply diffuse, they waft as long strings of molecules. And we're sensitive to that. So just releasing molecules near the nose wouldn't seem right. Also, there's no small palette of primary smells that can be combined to produce the full range of olfactory experience, like red, green, and blue can for color, so thousands of different molecules would be required. Finally, odor molecules tend to be persistent and sticky. So scent generators tend to end up smelling like a combination of all the smells they've ever emitted. So there's lots of potential for smell in VR, but it's going to take some serious research plus breakthrough delivery techniques to move it forward. Next, we come to the vestibular system, our built-in accelerometers and gyroscopes, which sense acceleration and change in orientation. The vestibular sense is essential to balance and our awareness of where we are in space, and it's particularly important for VR because conflict between our vestibular sense and what we see is a key cause of discomfort. In fact, people without functioning vestibular organs are generally immune to motion sickness. When you're in a first-person shooter in VR, and you spin and accelerate down a hallway, visual vestibular conflict is why you suddenly feel dizzy and break out in a cold sweat, or at least why I do. No names, but annoyingly, some people are completely unaffected. <laughs> 
So vestibular is high on the list of senses we'd like to drive well, but it's also at the top of the list of senses we don't know how to drive, because your vestibular organs are buried inside your skull. It's certainly possible to stimulate them by passing a current through them, but the effects of surface electrodes are very coarse. The only conceivable way right now to get fine control is to implant electrodes inside the skull, and I don't think we'd get 100% adoption on that, even from hardcore gamers. I'm not happy leaving the vestibular sense to future VR research, but right now there's no traction on the problem. When it comes to VR, hearing is my favorite sense because it can have a huge impact on VR experiences, especially in conjunction with vision, and there's actually a clear path to doing it almost perfectly. Clear doesn't mean easy, though. There's a lot to figure out between here and there. There are three elements of audio simulation: synthesis, propagation. And spatialization. Synthesis is the creation of source sounds. Right now, this is done with pre-recorded waveforms played back as point sources. But ultimately, it needs to be done by properly simulating the physical processes involved in the generation of sound, such as surface vibrations. This area is just starting to be studied, and it doing it right promises to be unbelievably computationally intensive. Next, we come to propagation: how sound moves around a space. I used to think that audio propagation would be simpler and less computationally demanding than graphics, since our visual sense is so much more acute than our hearing. But I was wrong for two reasons. Unlike light, sound waves of different frequencies diffract, reflect, and interfere very differently. Also, unlike light, sound travels slowly enough for the delay to be perceptible. This means sound has to be simulated as a 3D time series across many frequency bands. Which is much more expensive than generating a single instantaneous global solution per frame. As a result, audio propagation simulation is understood, but it's so computationally intensive that only approximations can be done in real time. And generalized hand handling of moving sources, listeners, and objects in real time is still an unsolved problem. Eventually, some of the sound waves bounce into the ear, and modeling this interaction is critical to giving the listener a sense of the direction of the incoming sound. That is, the sound spatialization. Ideally, that would just be a part of propagation, but simulating the way sound waves bounce off your shoulders, move around your head, and interact with the folds of your ears is nowhere near practical right now. The solution is to use the head-related transfer function, or HRTF, which provides a good approximation of how sound waves arriving at a particular person's head. Are transformed into sound waves traveling down the ear canal to the eardrum. HRTFs have a few drawbacks, though. The biggest one is that they need to be customized on a per-person basis, which currently requires a machine like this one, an anechoic room to use it in, and a person willing to sit still for an hour while the machine measures their HRTF. Arguably, not ready for broad consumer acceptance. Also, HRTFs have traditionally modeled sound as arriving from sources farther away than one meter. That has the advantage of being much more tractable because it removes distance from the calculations, but it also has the disadvantage of being wrong for anything within arm's reach. That means that if you want to work at a virtual workstation or play virtual ping pong, the technology doesn't yet exist to get the sound right. So we understand the equations that govern sound. But we're orders of magnitude short of being able to run a full simulation in real time, even for a single room with a few moving sound sources and objects. Great VR audio is a matter of getting many more teraflops, developing a lot of novel techniques and clever approximations, and figuring out how to generate high-quality HRTFs quickly and inexpensively. 20 years from now, you'll be able to hear a virtual pin drop, and it will sound right. The interesting question is how close we'll be able to get in five years. Now we come to the sense that's most strongly associated with VR: vision. We understand pretty much everything about the physics of light. We know how to generate photons with lasers, LEDs, micro LEDs, OLEDs, and micro OLEDs. And we know what those photons do when they pass through lenses, bounce down waveguides, hit diffraction gratings, bounce off micro mirrors, and go through liquid crystals. And with the rift, we're at the point where we can put enough of the right photons in the right places on the retina to create virtual experiences. For all that, though, we don't yet know how to get VR headsets to produce anything close to real-world vision, and that's what it's going to take to turn them into magic glasses. In VR, photons get delivered to the eye by some combination of light source and optics. There are five main attributes that we want from photon delivery systems: a wide field of view, 
excellent image quality, variable depth of focus, high dynamic range, and all day ergonomics. All of these areas need to improve to produce truly great VR, but improving one often works against one or more of the others. For example, if you want a very wide field of view, it's hard to keep image quality high. Similarly, image quality can interfere with,、uh, with uh, dynamic range, and everything interferes with ergonomics. With existing technology, VR photon delivery is currently a matter of trading, choosing the best trade off among these areas. And all currently known trade offs are a long way from real world vision. Here's where we are and where we want to be. Field of view is around 90 degrees, while we can see at least 220 degrees horizontally. Image quality is currently relatively low in several respects. It's fuzzy, and the image shifts subtly as the eye moves around. But the obvious deficit is in resolution, where we're at 10 to 15 pixels per degree, while 2020 vision requires up to 120 pixels per degree. For context, in conjunction with a 200 degree field of view, 2020 resolution would be 24K by 24K, something like 500 times as many pixels as we have right now, and most people have corrected vision that's better than 2020. Next, current VR headsets can only focus at one distance, and we need to support the full focal range of the human eye in order to properly replicate real world vision. The range and precision of displayed light is currently orders of magnitude less than we're capable of seeing. And finally, current ergonomics are more suitable for casual use than for hours of use on a daily basis. Eventually, we need to get a form factor close to sunglasses with an ideal weight of under 25 grams. Ergonomics isn't only a function of photon delivery, of course. Sensing, computation, power, connectivity, and industrial design all contribute as well. However, as long as photons get delivered by cell phone panels viewed through single lenses, The form factor can't get a lot smaller than it is today. Similarly, the current system doesn't have a lot of headroom to increase field of view while maintaining image quality. That means that getting to the next level of VR is going to require a photon delivery system that doesn't exist yet, based on either brand new technology or a novel combination of existing technologies. Unfortunately, I don't have time to dive into the many approaches that have the potential to improve photon delivery. Ranging from animation and graphics all the way to nanotechnology, but it's worth noting that vision clearly has multiple deep and challenging research issues. And vision is just one of the ways to drive the perceptual system. And driving the perceptual system is just one of the three pillars of VR, which should make it pretty clear why I think there's a lifetime's worth of interesting challenges still to be solved in VR. Finally, we come to haptics, by which I mean all the direct sensing that the body does. Both touch and kinesthesis, internally and on the skin. Haptics is at the core of the way we interact with our surroundings, and without it, we'll never be fully embodied in the virtual world. It's obvious that what we want is the full range of sensations across our bodies, especially our hands. What's not obvious is how to do that in a general purpose consumer device. I'm pretty sure this isn't the answer. As important as haptics potentially is for VR, It's embryonic right now. There's simply no existing technology or research that has the potential to produce haptic experiences on a par with the real world. So, any solution will have to come from breakthrough research. The senses are only the gateway to perception. The reality we perceive is constructed deep in the perceptual system in the brain by integrating and analyzing multiple sensed inputs in light of our prior model of the world. If we could drive the senses exactly the way the real world does, Then VR would be easy, but we can't. So we have to rely on perceptual psychology to explain how various sensing mechanisms work and how the sense data gets processed to produce a model of the world so we can find alternate ways to produce the desired experiences. Also, of course, we need to figure out how to reduce and ideally eliminate motion sickness. And since we can't directly stimulate the vestibular system or exert accelerations on your body, it's up to perceptual psychology and neuroscience to figure out alternative ways to do that. There's much more to be said about perceptual psychology and about driving the senses in general, but while creating virtual experiences is at the core of VR, it's only part of the equation. Great VR also requires the ability to sense and reconstruct the real world. Right now, we can track the headset and controllers, and that's an excellent start, but you won't be fully present in VR until you can see your own hands and body. Also, as good as the Rift and Oculus Touch are, 
VR won't reach its full potential as a social environment until you can see other people's avatars and truly believe that they are people. Finally, you'll want to be able to pull re the real world into VR to create mixed reality so that you can move around freely and interact with real objects such as keyboards and coffee mugs. To do all that, we'll need to be able to track faces, eyes, hands, bodies, physical objects, and your surroundings, and then reconstruct them in VR all in real time in a consumer-friendly package. That's a huge challenge for many reasons, including latency, compute, power, form factor, weight, sensor limitations, moving objects, and non-rigid objects. Excellent research is being done across the board in computer vision, including this work by Richard Newcomb, who recently joined us along with the rest of the Surreal Vision team. But none of the important areas are currently solved well enough for VR, and making all this work is going to require rethinking the entire sensing and reconstruction stack, both hardware and software, from the ground up. Nonetheless, the outlook is good. For example, the ability to reconstruct a room accurately enough for VR in real time doesn't yet exist. But consider this. This is an early real-time prototype from the Surreal Vision team, and it needs to get a whole lot better before the experience is as good as it needs to be. But imagine this happening automatically and seamlessly with proper texturing and lighting, and it's easy to see the enormous potential of pulling the real world into VR. Once we have the ability to drive the senses well enough to produce experiences that feel real, and we can track the real world well enough to bring ourselves and other people into it, we can think about how we want to interact with that virtual world. The feedback loop from vision to motor control to haptic sensation is one of the most powerful ways to create deeply convincing experiences. Oculus Touch is a huge step in that direction, but it's obvious that what we really want in the long run is for the hands to be able to act as the dexterous virtual manipulators that they are in the real world. That's incredibly hard, arguably harder than either driving the senses or reconstructing the real world for two reasons. The first problem is that there's no hope anytime soon of reproducing the haptics of the real world. There are several obstacles to this, but the showstopper is that there's no feasible way to fully reproduce real-world kinematics. Put another way, when you put your hand down on a virtual table, there's no known or prospective consumer technology that would keep your hand from going right through it. Bringing physical props into the, real, into the virtual world, mapping a real keyboard into VR, for example, can help. But if all we wanted was the real world, we wouldn't have bothered with VR in the first place. What we really want are virtual keyboards, as well as virtual levers, buttons, handles, and other tools and controls that work as well as their physical equivalents, along with the ability to manipulate a wide range of virtual objects. In order to make that happen, new haptic technology, primarily based on touch, and possibly combined with some localized kinesthetics, needs to be developed so the hands can sense and respond to virtual interactions. That will certainly be hard, but solving it will only get us to the second challenge, developing a whole new interaction language around that haptic technology. Imagine that it's 1970, and you've just invented the mouse, but still have to invent and implement the concept of a bitmapped windowing interface for the mouse to drive. That's where we'll be when we've developed good enough haptic technology. Figuring that out is going to take a lot of research and time, but I'm absolutely confident that the first haptic VR interface that really works will be world-changing magic on a par with the first mouse-based windowing systems. I wish I had more to tell you about interaction, but it's very early days. I've just laid out an enormous research space, one that covers all of human perception, half a dozen areas of sensing and reconstruction, and a whole new interaction model. Exploring that space will require world-class research in areas ranging from computational optics to material science to sensor technology and much more, along with equally strong engineering and programming. What's more, it will require a great deal of multidisciplinary work. This project, which we developed in collaboration with the University of Southern California, illustrates just how cross-disciplinary VR research is. Faces are particularly difficult to track in VR because the headset covers the top half of the face. Here's a first step we've taken toward solving that. In the video I'm about to play, note that you can see the user's expressions, including eyebrow raises and squints that are occurring under the headset.
To capture the user's upper facial expressions, we developed a prototype with flexible sensors embedded in the foam, shown in yellow. Making that happen required expertise in computer vision, novel sensor design, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, perceptual psychology, machine learning, programming, and facial animation, all to address just one of VR's many tracking problems. We've spent the last year building a team that covers all of the areas on this slide and more, capable of diving into everything I've talked about today. Now it's on to the hard part exploring that vast, uncharted research space as quickly and effectively as possible. This is the year that Consumer VR finally launched, and I wouldn't have missed this for anything. It's the culmination of a series of amazing and highly improbable events that nobody would have predicted just five years ago. And yet, this is just the beginning. The really interesting stuff is yet to come. Today, I'm going to talk about that future as far ahead as I can see into the fog of time, which is about five years. Science fiction writer El Sprague de Camp said, it does not pay a profit to be too specific. <laughs> Wise advice indeed. However, about three years ago, I made very specific predictions about what VR would be like in two years, and they seem to have pretty much come true. So, emboldened by that, I'm foolishly going to ignore DeCamp's advice and make another set of specific predictions. <laughs> I am, however, only going to make a certain type of prediction about the evolution of underlying VR platform technologies, such as displays and computer vision. I'm not going to talk about killer apps or what else might be running on that VR platform in five years for a couple of reasons. One reason is that platform technology is what I know the most about because it's what Oculus Research has been focusing on. Content can do only what the underlying technology makes possible, and our mission is to drive that enabling technology forward so that content creators like you can work their magic on top of it. The other reason I'm not going to talk about future VR applications is that I honestly have no idea what we're all going to be using VR for in five years. That doesn't bother me in the least. The potential of VR is obvious, and all of you are already well down the path to creating the apps that will make VR part of our everyday lives. Our goal at Oculus Research is to create the package of technologies that will enable you to do that, and that's what I'm going to pull the curtain back on a little bit today. Frankly, talking about this in public wasn't an easy decision to make. However, all of you are working on VR right now, at the very beginning, out of faith that it will become incredibly cool and important. And I think you deserve a glimpse of just how bright the future you're working toward is. Of course, I may be wrong on specifics, in fact, I guarantee that I will be wrong about at least some of them, but I'm highly confident that the overall trend is there. Enough of these predictions will come true so that VR five years from now will make today's VR look like something out of prehistory. One day, years from now, you'll fire up your original Rift, just for old time's sake, and it'll bring back great memories. But you'll wonder where your hands are. You'll be oblivious to the real world around you, and it won't look or sound quite as amazing as you remember. You'll go back to your spiffy new rift, and in that moment, you'll realize just how far we've come in five short years, and that you were part of making that happen. And then, of course, you'll start wondering why it's not as good as the holodeck yet. <laughs> so let's look into the future. The technologies I'll discuss fall into several main areas. Optics and displays, graphics, eye tracking, audio, interaction, ergonomics, and computer vision. I'm going to talk about each of these separately, although many of the technologies interact closely, as I'll note in places. I'll talk about where I think each might be in five years and some of the challenges involved in getting there. My predictions are for what will happen on the leading edge, which will be the high end of PC VR. These innovations will make their way to mobile VR over time, but power, compute, and pricing advantages mean the PC will provide the most sophisticated VR experience for a long time. What you're going to hear is what I think and hope VR will be in five years, but everything I'll discuss is still far out research at this point and may or may not ever show up in a product. So with the clear understanding that these are just my opinions and that there are no guarantees, let's peer into the future. We're primarily visual creatures, so delivering the right photons to the right places on the retinas at the right time is a pillar of VR. Here's where we are right now. 
Here's what our visual system is actually capable of. As you can see, there's a long way to go. We'd ideally have eight times the pixel density on each axis, three times the field of view, and variable focus. It's certainly going to take a while to get there. How far can we get in five years? Here are my predictions. Panel resolution is the easiest one, since there's been steady improvement in that for years, and it's fairly easy to extrapolate ahead. I think we'll be around 4K by 4K per eye in five years. However, there's an interesting trade off in how that resolution gets used. Pixel density is a function of both resolution and field of view. We could have a higher pixel density image with a narrower field of view, or a wider field of view with a lower pixel density image. It all depends on what field of view is achievable and how compelling a wider field of view turns out to be. It's my guess that a wider field of view will be very compelling, greatly increasing presence, and that VR will head toward the widest possible virtual image. Given that, I am predicting a 140 degree field of view, resulting in approximately 30 pixels per degree. Not as sharp as 2020 vision, but good enough to pass a driver's license test. A wider field of view with higher resolution will require a breakthrough in optics. For now, lenses of the sort currently used in the Rift have fundamental limitations with respect to image quality, and both Fresnel's and normal fisheye lenses can't get much past 100 degrees without unacceptable distortion. So, new optics technology will be required. I don't know what that enabling technology will be, but I'm confident that we'll find a way to break out well past 100 degrees. The final area for optics and display is depth of focus. The lenses of our eyes normally change shape in order to focus at the correct depth for whatever object we're currently looking at. However, the lenses in VR headsets have a fixed focus at about two meters. So, in VR, our eyes would ideally stay focused around two meters, even if we're looking at something right in front of our nose. That's actually great for a presbyope like me, since my eyes are, in fact, permanently focused around two meters. But for those of you with eyes that can actually change focus, it's less ideal. Your eyes end up focused closer than two meters when looking at something up close in VR, causing both near and far objects to be blurred. Is this a big problem? Clearly not, since this is how the Rift works today, and we all use the Rift a lot with good results. But would it be good to fix? Sure, particularly as resolution increases, making blurring more evident. Anything that makes virtual viewing more like the real world will increase comfort and the ability to stay in VR for long periods. So, how might we address this? That's an open area of research. There are several possibilities, including holographic displays, light field displays, multifocal displays, and varifocal displays, but none of them are close to being good enough yet, especially in head mountable form. At this point, I don't know which of these approaches will work, if any, but the problem feels tractable. So, I think that one way or another, VR will have good support for depth of focus in five years. The cumulative effect of depth of focus, higher resolution, wider field of view, and better optics will be VR that is highly comfortable, amazingly realistic, and deeply convincing. Given a great display, the obvious next requirement is graphics to drive that display. And that's not a trivial undertaking when it involves 16 megapixels per eye. More than an order of magnitude more than today at 90 hertz. As it happens, most of those pixels are wasted at any given time because the eye has only a very small area of full resolution. This area, called the fovea, is a mere three degrees across, the size of your thumb at arm's length, and resolution falls off rapidly away from the fovea. The obvious solution is to render pixels with variable density across the scene to match the eye's resolution. This is called foveated rendering. And it can potentially reduce the number of pixels rendered by an order of magnitude or even more. I'm sure all of you can appreciate how much easier it would be to hold frame rate if you only had to render one tenth the pixels. There are a couple of major challenges with foveated rendering. The first challenge is developing a rendering approach that can take full advantage of foveation. The traditional approach involves multiple passes and drawing a lot more pixels than needed. It may be necessary to redesign the entire graphics pipeline in order to realize the full potential. The second challenge is that foveated rendering requires virtually perfect eye tracking, which I'll discuss next. So, there are certainly obstacles to overcome, but my prediction is that foveated rendering will be a core VR technology in five years. 
Foveated rendering has a critical dependency, however. It can only become a core technology if eye tracking is completely reliable across the full range of eye motion for the entire user population. Because if it fails, visual quality will deteriorate drastically. A number of other potential breakthroughs have the same dependence on great eye tracking. You might think, how hard can it be to track a single convex organ in a confined space? And indeed, when we started Oculus Research, I assumed eye tracking just required some solid engineering. Two years later, I think that's true for tracking well enough to give avatars eyes. But it turns out that tracking at the level required for foveated rendering is not a solved problem at all. One reason is that pupil tracking is a key eye tracking technique like so. Here you can see the pupils are being tracked correctly. But pupils vary wildly, including this and this. And of course, pupils also change size and can even change shape. And here you can see they're not even the same size. Glint tracking off the cornea can help. But then there's the problem of eyelids. Not to mention fitting enough illuminators and cameras into a compact headset and positioning them so that tracking works across the full range of eye motion with deep eye sockets, flat faces, bulging eyes, and LASIK, and is 100% reliable in all those cases. Worse, the eye is not nearly as rigid as you think. The motion at the end is a little subtle, so let's look at it again. Watch the shape of the pupil as the eye stops. This is a problem because what we really want to know is where the image is on the retina. Tracking the outside of the eye can only give us an approximation of that. Ideally, we track the retina itself, but doing that in a headset across the full range of eye motion would require inventing a whole new type of eye tracking technology. Getting to extremely accurate, completely robust eye tracking may only require gathering a lot more data and doing a lot more engineering. Or it may require real research and new technology. But either way, great eye tracking is so central to the future of VR that I believe it will be solved five years from now. Although, I have to admit, it is the greatest single risk factor for my predictions. Audio is pretty straightforward. Five years from now, you'll be able to quickly and easily generate a personalized head-related transfer function, or HRTF, in the comfort of your own home. HRTFs describe how sound bounces off and diffracts around the head and especially the ears, and personalized HRTFs will provide the same sense of direction and distance for virtual sound that we have for real sound. There will also be technology for modeling the propagation of sound around virtual spaces, how sounds reflect, diffract, and interfere as they bounce around. So virtual rooms will feel much more convincing, even though you may not consciously know why. However, while the theory behind audio propagation is well understood, the computational demands of working implementations are so high that only certain sorts of constrained virtual spaces with limited movement of sound sources and listeners will be practical for propagation in five years. But those instances will be highly compelling and will point the way to steadily improving audio in the future. So far, we've only talked about improving our perception of the virtual world. What about interacting with it? Oculus Touch is so good that I think that it and its descendants are going to be the state of the art for at least five years and maybe much longer. It's quite possible that touch-like controllers could be the mouse of VR and still be the primary interaction technology 40 years from now. The only thing I can see displacing touch-like controllers is the ability to use your hands as direct physical manipulators, as you do in the real world. And I don't see that happening in the next five years, because it involves haptic and kinematic technology that isn't even on the distant horizon today. I do think that hand tracking and rendering will become a standard part of VR in the next five years, and will be a welcome addition for social act interaction. Touch's hand presence is a great addition for VR experience, but Avatars that reflect your exact hand movements will be even more personal and expressive. It will also be useful to be able to use hand gestures to control simple interfaces and perform lightweight direct manipulation when you don't want to bother using touch or the simple input device. For example, when you just want to watch a movie in VR. Typing on virtual keyboards overlaid on real surfaces or even floating in midair will also become practical and will be handy. But without haptics and kinematics, the applications of virtual hands will be limited compared to the real world. 
So my prediction is that in five years, we'll see good avatar hand tracking and gesture-based simple interface control, but touch-like controllers will still be the dominant mode for sophisticated VR interactions. In an ideal world, we wouldn't even strap a device onto our head. We'd just walk into the holodeck. We won't be able to do that any time in the foreseeable future, and no, we're not working on it. <laughs> But we can work on making the device more comfortable and the experience better. Ways I think that will happen over five years include reduced weight, better weight distribution, and more convenient handling of prescription correction. But the biggest change I expect to see at the high end is wireless headsets. This is not just a comfort and convenience issue, although it certainly is that. The key is that in conjunction with the computer vision advances I'll discuss next, eliminating the tether will allow you to move freely about the real world while in VR, yet still have access to the processing power of a PC. The challenge here is developing a wireless link with enough bandwidth to meet the needs of VR. There's no existing consumer electronics link that's up to the task at current resolutions, let alone at the 4K by 4K resolution I expect in five years. This is one reason foveated rendering is so important. Without the pixel reduction it provides, it will be very difficult to go wireless on the PC. Most of the technologies I've talked about so far is focused on matching digital input and output to the human perceptual and motor systems. Since that's the only way to get information into and out of our brain until someone comes up with a way to jack in, that, all of that is absolutely critical for a great virtual experience. But there's a real world out there on the other side of our perceptual system, and bringing that into VR would be hugely compelling. We'd be able to move around safely and confidently, pick up coffee mugs, see who just came into the room, be anywhere on Earth we wanted to be, and interact with anyone on the planet. There would no longer be a sharp line between VR and reality. Instead, we'd have a mixed reality that would let us choose whatever elements of each we wanted at any time. I'll call this mixed reality augmented VR. There are many, many aspects to making that work, but the two main themes are sensing and reconstructing the real world in general and virtual humans. Reconstructing the real world is challenging, but doable. You can go out right now and have someone scan a space and give you a model of it. Doing that with a consumer device in real time is another matter entirely, and yet that's what's needed to make augmented VR really useful. My prediction is that five years from now, augmented VR will be an integral part of virtual reality, and that it will transform VR into something that will be used for longer and for many more things than it can be today. While there are many unsolved problems and a lot of research and engineering still needs to be done, augmented VR is so important that I'm confident all the obstacles will be overcome and that the boundary between virtual reality and real reality will progressively blur over the next five years. Augmented VR will be quite different from the mixed reality that's possible with see-through AR glasses. With augmented VR, we will have a full model of the real scene and complete control over every pixel. So we'll be able to modify reality and mix it with the virtual world in literally any way we want. Any part of the scene could be virtual or real, and we could also mix it too closely. For example, changing the colors and textures of real surfaces or warping real textures across virtual surfaces. We could even send a model of a space to someone somewhere else, so that location itself becomes virtual. And what would be even cooler would be interacting with them in that space. Other people are the most interesting thing in the world to most of us, and I believe that the development of virtual humans is going to be the single most important factor in making VR a part of our everyday lives, thanks to the social interaction that will enable. It's also perhaps the single most challenging aspect of virtual reality. People are non-rigid and physically highly complex. There are more than 25 degrees of freedom just in one hand. The face is even more complex, and we are incredibly sensitive to the subtleties of gestures and expressions, as well as the fine movements of eyes. The bar here is extremely high, and the technology for real-time capture and reproduction of humans with consumer technology is nowhere near that bar today. At the same time, Tremendous progress has been made over the last few years in all aspects of virtual humans. Today, we can do near-perfect hand tracking, but it requires retroreflector-studded gloves and lots of cameras. In five years, though, it should be possible to have avatar hands that are close to this level. Faces are incredibly subtle and complex to reproduce, especially with a headset on, but the technology is getting there.
And real-time markerless body tracking is now a realistic goal. As you can see, machine learning makes it possible to do accurate pose estimation over a very wide variety of circumstances. <laughs> there will be a huge amount of work on virtual humans over the next five years, and we'll certainly see a number of systems that provide a limited experience of being with another human being, basically improved versions of the toy box demo. But like toy box, they will be on the other side of the uncanny valley from truly human avatars. And while they'll be entertaining and useful, you will never for one moment feel like you're in the presence of a true human, much less a specific, unique individual. I think this area is so hard that five years from now, virtual humans will be widely used for social interaction and highly entertaining, but will not yet be convincingly human. And the real breakthrough will be yet to come. So that's a look at the underlying technologies of VR and how I think they'll evolve over the next five years. The obvious next question, of course, is if I'm right, what does that imply for the VR experience five years from now? I said I wasn't going to talk about killer apps or what else might be built on the underlying technology, but I will talk about one application because it's one I personally want and expect to be using in five years. And it shows how all the platform technologies come together to create something that's greater than the sum of its parts. I talked about this application last year. It's a virtual workspace, a VR environment that you could configure any way you wanted, with virtual screens, holograms, whiteboards, and whatever, then switch between configurations instantly. Done well enough, that's the most productive solo work environment I can imagine. And then if we add virtual humans, it would become an amazingly productive group work environment as well. As just one simple example, imagine having a whiteboard session with any number of people you want, no matter where they are, and with an infinite number of whiteboards of any size capable of showing anything from text to images to videos to holograms, all easily searched and archived. Let's look at what it would take to make that happen. First, we need enough resolution and good enough image quality so that virtual monitors can replace real monitors. That obviously requires very high-res displays and much improved optics, but that's just the start. It also requires the ability to render at that high resolution and to transmit the data over a wireless link because you won't want to have to deal with a tether all day while you work, which means we need foveated rendering, which may mean we need a new graphics pipeline and certainly means we need great eye tracking. Next, we need to be able to do augmented VR because we want to be able to see our surroundings in real time so we can move about and interact with our desk and chair and likely also our keyboard, mouse, and beverage of choice. We also need to be able to see our hands in order to be able to interact with the real world and our body so that we can move around with confidence. All that takes great computer vision. And if we're going to be doing work with our hands, we're going to want depth of focus support in order to make that comfortable for hours of use per day. And we'll want proper spatialization and propagation of virtual sound so that virtual objects will sound as real as they look. That's great for solo work. Teamwork requires even more. Obviously, it will require avatars, the more convincing, the better. Less obviously, it will require a wider field of view so that everyone in a meeting can see each other. That's critical for social interaction, as are voices that sound like they're coming from the right people in the right places. Finally, we'll want to be able to share our environments with each other, both for social purposes and because physical objects will often be important to the discussion. In short, a virtual workspace that makes us more productive than the real world requires pretty much everything I've talked about today. Advances in each of the technology areas by themselves will be useful, but together these advances will make it possible to create a system that will revolutionize the way we work. Not all of that will be in place in five years, but I think we'll be far enough along so that we will start doing real work in VR. And while the virtual workspace is the only VR application that I can envision that clearly, I'm highly confident that the advances I foresee over the next five years, combined with the hard work of all of you, will likewise revolutionize gaming, entertainment, education, communications, and more. Together, we're creating the platform that will be the basis for the next few decades of how we work, play, and interact. Thanks to all our efforts, VR is going to leap ahead over the next five years. What VR is, is it's the second great wave. It's the wave in which instead of looking at it through these portals, we actually just live in it. And to do that, we're going to need another critical mass of people, very similar to Xerox PARC,
covering a whole range of things, right? Computer vision, optics, audio, um, interaction. All these pieces have to come together into that platform that will let us be really in that digital world. And I've said this before, the thing I want is I want a virtual workspace where I can just put on the headset and I can have whatever configurations I want, switch between them, teleport to see people. And that is going to be that second great wave. And that's what we're trying to put together. Well, in, in order to do that, just as they came up with you know, the, these tropes and conventions that enabled us to communicate with computers better than typing in a command line there, you know, there's no, going to be no keyboards. And, you know, and you know, the, uh, we're going to be immersed in this reality there. We're going to need new conventions and, and new kinds of interfaces. I know you're you know, like a big admirer of what Doug Engelbart did. He was the, the man who really came up with his team of you know, uh, the tools we use, like the mouse and Windows and uh, you know, de the desktop you know, in order to do this. So what, what, when you think about what these conventions will be in virtual reality, you know, what, what do you think and how do you come up with the conventions that are going to allow us to you know, move around and you know, can accomplish things in this new platform? I think we are at an Engelbart moment. What I think is interesting this time, instead of one person with a specific vision, what we have is we have all these people. And everybody here, in one way or another, is running that experiment of how do we interact with the virtual world when we're immersed in it. Um, and one of the places I see that that I think is great is how do you move without having discomfort, right? And I've seen many, many different approaches. I'm hypersensitive to that. And it's amazing how much better that has gotten over the last year. And it's really because we're running all these experiments. So I think that what it's going to be is that's going to be the community. So I know one thing, and I, I think you talked about this at a previous keynote, that one thing you have a vision of and you saw sketches of it are you know, a, a very lightweight way to project reality on, onto our senses, like glasses there, and you're not alone in, in this. Maybe you know, Oculus was a, a, a little ahead uh, in the competition among the bigger companies there, but right now uh, we know that you know, obviously Google and, Fate and, and Amazon and uh, Apple, you know, other players, Magic Leap, Snap, they're, they're all looking at, at, at the same thing. Do you think this is going to be sort of the alpha competition of the 2020s? Who's able to come up with like a, a lightweight, like glasses, uh, way of projecting virtual reality or augmented reality on, on, on people? And, you know, the, with the, the winner goes the spoils? I, what I would say is it's obvious to me that this is the next platform. And I think it's obvious to a lot of people. And I think it's going to be a very exciting future doing it. And I think we're incredibly well positioned. But what I'm really thinking is, I can't wait to get to that future. So in your writings and in, in, in your, the, when, you, when you talk, uh, you talk a lot about um, a vision where there'll be a persistence to what, what we have there. We're, uh, it, it won't be something we use just for a couple minutes a day, but will be part of our daily existence there. Um, how, how important is that to have to develop something that's going to be a, a routine part of our lives as opposed to you know, a special experience? Well, I, I think that when you talk about something being a next platform, the key is that it's something that is an important part of our life. How much of the time isn't really the key. The key is that it's something that every day you'll think, yeah, I'm just going to do this as a matter of course. So trying to think of the last time that I didn't look at my phone for a whole day, and I huh. think it's been a very long time. Mm -hmm. and the last time I didn't look at a computer. And really, this is, this is going to be a primary way that we interact with what we do for work, for play, for how we connect with other people. And what are the challenges in, in making that happen? You know, maybe, maybe just start you know, talking about the, the idea of, of like persistence. You know, in order to you know, have something that, that's you know, uh, going to be, be comfortable, you know, I think earlier in the keynote, someone alluded to you know, these headsets, as great as they are, you know, are going to, going to be evolved. It's up to you uh, and your team to, to evolve them. What do you, what do you, how do you do that? And there are so many ways that it does need to evolve to actually fulfill that potential. I mean, there's magic there now, but I think everybody in this room would love to see super high resolution with really good focus at all depths, with a field of view as wide as the human field of view. They would love to be able to bring in real world things like desks, keyboards, other people, move around freely. 
Um, and they'd love to be able to interact with things in a more natural, fluid way. And everybody sees that in the long run, the limit is can we do something that starts to rival our real experiences. So I think we're just at the beginning of a very, very long path that's going to be very exciting. And, you know, uh, so you talk about some of the you know, specific directions you're doing. You know, you said before in, in one of your talks about, you know, we need some scientific breakthroughs that aren't here yet in order to really bring a, a, a to realize, you know, what, what you think that uh, this platform should be. You know, so I know you're not going to give us any trade secrets, but, but maybe talk about some directions you're going there that uh, bring us closer to that vision. So I'll talk about one specific thing, which I think everybody here could identify with, which is how do we get so that you can have really sharp visual clarity all the time? And right now, the headsets have fixed lenses that focus you at two meters. And that means that everything closer than one meter is really not as sharp as it could be. And as resolutions go up and as optics improve, that will become more and more apparent. And obviously, especially if you can start bringing the real world, you want to do things within arm's length. So there are a number of ways that that could possibly be addressed. So for example, the ultimate solution would probably be holography. If you could have glasses that gave you a holographic image, it would be an awful lot like seeing the real world. Another approach would be to have a very, very um, fine lens, uh, uh, array of fine lenses that can create a light field that approximates reality. Another way to do it would be to have multiple planes, each one at a different depth. And yet another way would be to change the focal depth to match where you're looking. All these are possible solutions. The problem is none of them are workable product solutions yet. Hmm. So those are all interesting directions to go in, and they're partly research, and they're partly thinking about how they could be engineered. Um, and every one of them is difficult, but every one of them is, is potentially a solution. So in other words, you, know, you listed about probably a half dozen approaches there. Are you working on like, every single one of those and, and experimenting in those? I would say that at, at some level, we're working with each of them. Um, so the thing is that some of them are very far off, or a huge amount of technological innovation would have to happen to make it work, and others are more interesting engineering and human factors problems. But yes, we are looking across that whole range because who knows what the solution will be. So that, that, that's really interesting. You, see, you talk about like, the long term there. Um, do you have uh, any you know, deadlines on when you've got to produce this stuff, or is it totally open-ended? Well, which is kind of a scary thing to shareholders, maybe. It, it is research, which I define as when you start, you don't know for sure that you can deliver what you started on. Um, and the way that I think about it is that when something is started, within three to 10 years, if it works out, that it, you could imagine that it could ship in a product and really have impact. So it's not open-ended, and we don't have people who kind of think deep thoughts and things that maybe in 20 or 30 years could be interesting and publish a paper about it. But at the same time, we don't work on things that are obviously um, just engineering and deliverable. Uh, Facebook itself is you know, a, a huge you know, uh, consumer and creator of artificial intelligence there. What's the role of AI and machine learning and what, what you're doing? Machine learning is a critical part of making many of the systems that um, need to happen become good enough. So for example, if you take something like hand tracking, it can help a huge amount if what you do is you use machine learning to help, um, help start the searches for things. So it's not that you just throw things into a machine learning framework, but machine learning can be critical for helping parts of various pipelines work much better. And so it's a hybrid system. Um, in the long run, I do expect that machine learning and AI will be a significant part of the whole virtual experience. Um, I mean, in the end, what we'd really love to have is a great assistant, right? Um, but that's not really something that I personally am working on. Um, what's the relationship between Oculus Research and the Oculus that we see here and, you know, and presents you know, the, 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 the products there? Is there stuff that you've done that are showing up in this generation of, of products. Um, talk about the pipeline. So the relationship is that our purpose is to put things into that pipeline and work with the product team so that everybody here gets to use them and gets to write software that leverages them. So that is, that's the reason we're here. Um, there's nothing in the current generation that has come from us because there hasn't been enough time to even hit that three-year time frame. But there are certainly a number of things that we could see over the next few years. 
and especially certainly over the next five years, four years, because <laughs> a year ago I said, here's where I think we will be in five years, and obviously we play a part in that. For Are you sure. on track with that? Are you, you, now you, would you say the same things, here's where we'll be in the next four years? Yeah, I would say the same things. I might actually bump a few of them up. So give me more of a sense of what the world will be like when you uh, do realize, or if, you know, let's assume you do, uh, what, what, what you want to do. What, what, how will our lives be different um, by switching to that platform? So the first thing I'll say is, you, you know, when you say when, if, th this is going to happen. It's really a question of how quickly it happens, because it's not technologically impossible, and it is so powerful that it will happen. So, I could be wrong, wait a minute, but wait a minute. I'm clear on that. Right? So that, that, that's an amazing statement of confidence that, you know, maybe in this room, you know, it, it doesn't raise an eyebrow, but I, I think out, out, outside it would. Why are you so confident? You know, I, maybe if it can be done, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be done, that people will adopt it. Um, you know, uh, that, gra that grandmother in England was really cool to adopt it, but there might be some people who are a little reluctant to go there. I, certainly there will be, but so let's take ourselves back to 1973. And let's say that what we have is we have a Xerox Park Alto sitting on the table between us. Mm -hmm. And you'll be saying, well, what makes you say that everyone's gonna be using these things? I mean, you know, you look at it, it's kind of big, it's kind of slow, what would they use it for? I remember back in the day what people would say is, well, you could use it to store recipes on, which was mm -hmm. not the world's biggest winning argument. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, no one would have foreseen any of the things that came on top of that, right? They, they wouldn't have foreseen, for example, 3D real-time graphics. They wouldn't have foreseen Facebook. They wouldn't have foreseen the whole internet, right? And they certainly wouldn't have foreseen computers in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So it is true that one needs to have a little bit of vision here when you think about it. But to me, it is so obvious that just as back in 1973, you could have seen this unfolding, at least in general, by saying, wait a minute, you have access to all this information, all this computing power. It has to be incredibly valuable. Right. Now to say, what we have is we have access to driving your full perceptions with this so that you can actually be in this thing, experiencing this thing. So I've talked about you know, the one thing that I want is that virtual workspace. It's because that's the thing that would affect my life right now directly. What does that virtual workspace look like? The virtual workspace, to me, in the near future, meaning in the next maybe five years, you have a desk, right? You have a keyboard, you have a mouse. They're all mapped in by computer vision, so you can use them. But they're in a virtual space that reskins it and then puts up whatever else you want with it. So you could have 100 screens, you could have a hologram, you can have a whiteboard and be talking with someone else. Other people can teleport in. They, uh, you can teleport into them. They can look over your shoulder. You can work together. Basically, think of it as it's like your real workspace, except it's completely malleable. And that is, I see that because that's what would affect me. But there, if you look at other people, if you gave them access to it, they would see so many other things that were entertainment, productivity, um, just, for example, just being a tourist, going places, mm -hmm. just visiting with other people. The, the potential really is kind of the potential of reality, right? Um, it's not even what is the killer app, because what's the killer app for reality? It's all the things you can do. So do um, you think in, in our apartments, you know, that, that basically we'll get, you know, uh, the physical objects piped in, and then, you know, so we'll, we won't bump into things, but, you know, we could make it uh, some other place. You know, it could be, a, you know, like a palace or a cave. Or... And one of the things that I think many of the people in this room will ultimately be doing interesting work with is you can reskin things, that's easy. You can put virtual things in the scene, not a big problem. Taking real things out of the scene, probably not. Oh, so no. the question is how you create interesting settings that adapt to what your physical surroundings are. You know, in, uh, it's just fascinating to speculate on, on what happens when we, you know, uh, go into immerse ourselves in this artificially created, you know, uh, kind, kind of reality there. But in recent months, uh, we've been, you know, talking, the, the term alternative reality is being used in a, in a different context there, uh, in terms of, you know, political and even propaganda sense, of people talking about all alternate facts there. And I'm wondering, if this vision comes about, um, there might be ways to tinker with our reality there, uh, or, or even hack it. I'm wondering if we're going to be sitting here in 10 years talking not about fake news, but fake reality. 
Well, I mean, this, this is a technology, and how the technology gets used, what the framework around it is, is a separate thing. And I think that the point you raise is a great point to think about as this matures. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you have those kinds of conversations there, or is it just heads down, let's do the work? Um, the way I think about it is, first, we need to figure out how to make this work well enough. And once that's in sight, then it's useful to think about the entire framework. But right now, it is incredibly hard to move this forward. And that's really where all the attention is. And I, and I know that you know, uh, we've been talking about the, 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 this earlier. Uh, to get like 95% of your scale of, of vision there you know, is a huge gap between 100%. Does it have to be an all or nothing kind of thing to deliver the experiences you want to do? No, not at all. But 100%, boy, 100% is basically mapping to reality, right? And I think huh. that one is long way off. So the question is, in my mind, when do we even get to like 25%? Because there's so much more that can be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I guess, you know, uh, when you go back there, you know, what, what's the next thing? that you're going to be you know, uh, uh, doing it in, in, uh, at Oculus Research. What, what do you, what, what's your, your focus now? Is it you know, uh, building the team? Uh, is there any area that you, in particular, are working on? Um, in particular, I'm working on building the team and overall the direction that we're moving in. But um, it, it, it isn't one thing. That's the fascinating part. This is a platform. And so you, know, you wouldn't have gone to Xerox Park and said, well, who's working on the mouse? Because a mouse without for example, windowing graphics without fonts, without a laser printer, it kind of limits what you can do. And so there's how do we get photons into your eyes better? How do we give you better computer vision for self-presence, for other people's presence, for the surroundings around you? How do we do audio better? How do we let you interact with the world better? It is a whole package. And each piece can move forward some on its own. But in the long run, you really want all the pieces to come together. And one really good example is, suppose that we magically let you use your hands perfectly in VR, right? You just reach out, you grab virtual objects. Well, remember that thing I said about where you're focused? Everything within hand's length wouldn't actually be very sharp and well-focused, right? Mm -hmm. So you really need to solve that problem, too. And it just goes on and on like that, where you need all these pieces to come together into the right system and platform. You know, um, I recently saw a, a, a system, you know, not, not in your lab, but uh, where they were, you know, using a, a, an armband to take, you know, uh, signals from the brain to control things. You know, uh, I know elsewhere in Facebook, they're working on the brain machine interface. Could that be part of what you're doing? It absolutely could be. You know, the fascinating thing here is, we are just at the beginning. I mean, everybody here is a pioneer on something, and I, I know that you're all excited about it. I know you think it's going to be big. I don't think you understand exactly how big it's going to be. I'm pretty sure if you went back to those people from Xerox Park in 1973 to now, and you said, did you realize how big this was going to be, how much you were going to change the world, they would never have realized that. And actually, I'll tell you a funny story, which is that I talked to one of the people who was key there. And I said, how did you have this vision? And he said, oh, we didn't actually have a vision. We we're just working on a bunch of technologies. <laughs> um, so they didn't really realize what it was going to be. And, and someday, looking back, you will realize exactly how big this thing was and how important a part you played. And um, there's just so much to do. And it's so exciting. Today is the fourth time I've had the privilege of giving a Connect keynote. And as I was thinking about what I'd like to share with all of you, I realized that this was the perfect opportunity to look back at what I've said about the future and see whether it still holds up. So let's take a stroll down memory lane. At the first Oculus Connect, I told you that VR was going to change the world. Although we're not there yet, I'm more certain than ever that that will happen. VR and AR, which, as I'll discuss later, will soon start to converge, are together going to replace personal computers and mobile as the primary ways humans interact with information and with each other. At OC2, I talked about how these are the good old days, because we're VR pioneers creating the future, a rare privilege that is all too often only appreciated in retrospect. And I talked about the key technology areas that would have to come together to take VR to the next level. Three years later, I'm even more confident about all that. In my opinion, these are absolutely still the good old days, and they're actually going to get even better. Not only are we still creating the future, but over the next few years, we're going to see the rate of change accelerate sharply, and the future we're creating is going to be brighter than I predicted. 
As for the key technology areas, at OC3, I made specific predictions about where they would be in five years, and that's what most of today will be about. And yes, in case you're wondering, I do wear a blue shirt every day. <laughs> it does not pay a profit to be too specific. Overall, my two-year predictions are looking pretty good, but I was perhaps a little more specific than I should have been. Not about the technologies themselves, but about their timing. I think most of what I talked about will be in consumers' hands a year later than I thought, four years from now rather than three. But apart from that, not only are the predictions still on track, it's actually starting to look like I underestimated in some areas. When I say that we're creating the future, I mean that literally. The world our children and grandchildren live in will be defined by the work we're doing today. Imagine a VR headset that's a sleek, stylish, lightweight visor with a 200-degree field of view, retinal resolution, high dynamic range and proper depth of focus, with audio that's so real you can't believe it's computer generated, that lets you mix real and virtual freely, that lets you meet, share, and collaborate with people regardless of distance, and that lets you use your hands to interact with the virtual world. If that existed, we'd be working, playing, and connecting in it every day. Imagine AR glasses that are socially acceptable and all-day wearable, that give you useful virtual objects like your phone, your TV, and virtual workspaces, that give you perceptual superpowers, a context-aware personal assistant, and above all, the ability to connect, share, and collaborate with others anywhere, anytime. If those glasses existed today, we'd all be wearing them right now. That's all obvious, and while it may be hard to believe, it's all doable. We really will be wearing those AR glasses and working, playing, and connecting in VR before too long. There's just one minor obstacle. The technology that would allow most of that to happen doesn't yet exist, but it will. Now, that's possible partly because there's a new, very positive twist to the future that I envision for VR. When I made my predictions two years ago, they were based on my extrapolations of the research and development work we'd been doing in VR. Since then, though, our work on AR has ramped up a great deal, and over the last two years, two important points have become clear. The first is that VR and AR have a great deal of overlap. It's always been obvious that 20 or 30 years from now, you'll just have one pair of glasses that supports everything from purely virtual to entirely real, but technology limitations, especially in the display, have forced completely separate VR and AR paths to date. For those same reasons, VR and AR products will continue to be on different paths for a while, with VR providing the richest, most immersive experience, while AR gives you all-day, socially acceptable access to information, virtual objects, telepresence, and a virtual assistant. But the technology they're built on and the functionality they provide will increasingly converge, especially as VR acquires good mixed reality capabilities. This is no longer a someday thing. It will happen over the next decade, and I expect it to start to have a major impact in four to five years. The second thing that's become clear is that VR can advance farther and faster by leveraging AR technology. Now, VR didn't require breakthrough technology to become product worthy. And in fact, most of what you'll find in a VR headset is modified off the shelf technology. That doesn't mean that it was easy or that current VR isn't good. It just means that when you can, for example, make a good display system using technology developed for smartphones, you don't try to develop a completely new, risky display system that might be even better. But no off-the-shelf display technology is good enough for AR, so we had no choice but to develop a new display system. And that system also happens to have the potential to take VR to a different level. The same is true pretty much across the board, and it's why I said at the beginning that we're going to see the rate of change for VR accelerate sharply, and that the future is going to be even brighter than I predicted. Having said that, I'll say the same thing I said two years ago. What you're going to hear is what I think and hope the future of VR will be, but what I'll discuss may or may not ever show up in a product. So with the clear understanding that these are just my opinions and that there are no guarantees, let's revisit these predictions. Here are the areas I made predictions about at OC3. Let's look at each of them in turn, starting with optics and displays. We're visual creatures, and the display is the most prominent part of the VR experience. Here's what I predicted for 2021. 4K by 4K panel resolution, 30 pixels per degree, a 140 degree field of view, and variable depth of focus. That's actually only three predictions because pixels per degree is a function of total resolution and field of view. This is a case where I clearly undershot. 
Many of you no doubt saw the description of the Half Dome prototype at F8. Half Dome achieved two of my three display predictions two year, three years early. It has a 140 degree field of view and varifocal depth of focus. And while Half Dome has roughly the same resolution as the Rift, 4K panels that would provide 30 pixels per degree over a 140 degree field of view have already been shown publicly, and using one in Half Dome would be straightforward. So I'm comfortable saying that I nailed this prediction. However, one thing that I didn't predict two years ago was equally rapid progress on the algorithms driving varifocal displays. Without varifocal, everything appears blurred when you look at a nearby object, such as this robot's hand, an unnatural condition that is obviously not an ideal visual experience. With varifocal, both near and far objects always appear sharp. This is also an unnatural condition that, while better, is still not an ideal visual experience. Fixing this requires rendering depth of field blur that varies depending on where you're looking, which is very challenging to do in a physically accurate manner. However, we've made significant progress on solving this problem with Deep Focus, an AI-driven renderer that can reproduce natural gaze contingent blur in real time. Here's correct blur when looking at the robot's hand. Notice that the hand is sharp while the background is properly blurry. And here's the correct blur when looking at the far wall. In the coming months, we'll be publishing our Deep Focus research and making the trained networks freely available to experiment with and build upon. So Half Dome and Deep Focus are very cool, but that's just the start for optics and displays, which is the poster child for how progress is accelerating. There are actually two ways in which we're already moving past Half Dome, and both of them have tremendous potential. One of these is a technology known as pancake lenses. Pancake lenses have been around for decades, but are only now becoming truly practical. They use polarization-based reflection to fold the optic path into a very small space, which results in several advantages over the Fresnels that are currently used. For one thing, they enable much sharper images, allowing full benefit from higher resolution panels. Given the right panels, they could potentially reach retinal resolution. They can also support ultra-wide fields of view, all the way out to somewhere around 200 degrees. Finally, they enable much more compact headset form factors. That all makes pancake lenses very appealing, but I should note one limitation. You can get either a very wide field of view or a very compact headset with pancake lenses, but not both at the same time. So pancake headsets may be optimized for form factor and comfort rather than field of view, but if so, that will be a choice because they could have had an ultra-wide field of view instead. I'm not making any predictions about whether or when pancake lenses will ship, but they make it obvious that the rate of change has ramped up from what I anticipated two years ago. Remarkably, though, the long-term display technology slope is actually steepening even more thanks to AR technology. That comes in the form of waveguides, where light is injected into a thin glass plate and bounces down it, getting deflected out towards the eye a bit at a time as it bounces along. Waveguides are only a few millimeters thick, so it's possible to make extremely slim light displays with them. There are no inherent resolution limitations, and they could potentially extend to any desired field of view in a slim form factor, so it would be possible to build a sunglasses-like waveguide visor with retinal resolution. Here's a concept drawing, which I want to emphasize is not an actual prototype, much less a product, of what a waveguide VR headset could look like. So while something like that is still years in the future, it's so compelling that I expect it to eventually happen. So for display, not only have my predictions already come true, but I'm more excited about the future than ever. Next, we come to graphics. Here, my prediction involved foveated rendering, where rendering resolution varies across the screen to match that of the retina. Here's what might actually be rendered as the eye moves around a scene. The white square shows where the eye is looking. As you can see, detail falls off sharply away from the foveal area, and most of the scene is rendered very coarsely, saving a great deal of rendering work. This sparse rendering can then be upsampled into a normal full resolution frame buffer that is perceptually indistinguishable from a full resolution render when viewed in a VR headset. My prediction was that foveated rendering would be used to decrease the rendering load by an order of magnitude. I think that prediction will hold up, but what I didn't anticipate was how the missing pixels would be filled in. A new and very promising approach is to use deep learning to fill in the details. The generated pixels won't be exactly right, but because they're away from the fovea, that doesn't matter. What's important is that it will look right to your peripheral vision. Let's look at an example. 
Here's a full resolution image. Now, here's that same image with 95% of the pixels removed in a pattern that matches the distribution of resolution across the retina, assuming that the viewer is looking at the white square near the lower right. Now let's use deep learning to fill in the missing pixels. It's not exactly right, of course. A lot of detail is lost as you move away from the white square, especially if you look at the mountains and fields at the left side of the screen. Here, let's do a blink comparison to make that clearer. Here's the original, and here's the deep learning reconstruction. But those differences would be indistinguishable from the original image when looking directly at the white square in a VR headset. And the reconstructed version requires rendering only 1 20th as many pixels as full resolution. Here's a deep render learning approach applied to the sparse rendering we saw in the earlier video. If you look closely, you can see that there's fine detail only around the white square, but again, this would look exactly right to someone whose eyes are following the square. There's still a lot of work to do here, but I'm comfortable sticking with a prediction of foveated rendering within four years. The other... <laughs> The other major challenge with foveated rendering was the requirement for eye tracking. Two years ago, I predicted we'd have great eye tracking, but I thought it was a significant risk. It's still a risk, but I'm more comfortable than I was two years ago in saying highly reliable eye tracking will be here within four years. After all, it obviously works in Half Dome today, and while that's not the same as working across the entire population in a shipping product, getting the rest of the way there should be doable. I had two predictions for audio. One was that there would be solid technology for modeling the propagation of sound around virtual spaces. That is, how sound reflects, diffracts, and interferes as it bounces around. So virtual rooms would feel much more convincing, even though you might not consciously know why. The first propagation code is already on its way into product, and that will steadily improve over the next few years. The other prediction was that personalized head-related transfer functions, or HRTFs, would become a standard part of the VR experience. HRTFs describe how sound bounces off and diffracts around the head, and especially the ears, which is the key to enabling truly convincing directional sound. Now, you might think that sounds nice, but not particularly significant, kind of like a better form of stereo. And I might have agreed with you until recently. But a few weeks ago, I had my first demo with my own personalized HRTF. I put on special open-ear headphones and sat down in front of a table that had a cassette player on it. A researcher put a cassette in and turned the player on, and music started playing. She picked up the player and moved it around me, and I listened as it happened, wondering what the point of this was. I was asked to close my eyes and point to the player, and I did it successfully about a dozen times. Then she put it down and popped out the cassette, and the music kept playing. It took me a minute to understand that the player had never made any noise. The sound was entirely from the headphones, but spatialized perfectly as the player moved. Even once I understood that, it was so convincing that I had to lift the headphones away from my ears to prove to myself that they were really the source of the music. It was like no computer-generated audio I've ever heard before, and it was utterly convincing. Audio presence is a real thing. Personalized HRTFs are going to be a huge step forward for the VR experience, especially paired with great visuals for multimodal impact. However, they're also one of the riskier of my predictions. Obviously, they're currently doable, but the challenge is to make the process of generating them a lot easier. My HRTF was the result of a 30-minute scan of my ears, followed by a lengthy simulation, which definitely doesn't qualify as consumer-friendly. I'll stand by this prediction, but I acknowledge that it may take longer than I thought. For interaction, by which I mean the ways in which we make selections and perform actions in the virtual world, my prediction was that we'd have good hand tracking and gesture-based control of simple interfaces, with touch continuing to be the preferred mode for sophisticated interactions, and I'll stick with that. I also noted, though, that the only thing that I thought could fully displace touch-style controllers was the ability to use your hands directly, complete with haptics, to interact with objects in the virtual world, and that I didn't think that that would happen in the next five years, that, in fact, it wasn't even on the distant horizon. I still don't think it'll happen in the next four years, but something interesting may, in fact, be on the distant horizon. This is definitely a deep research problem right now, but here's a video of one experiment.
I predict the first time you get to use your hands with haptics in VR will be as much of a revelation as the first time that you put on a VR headset. Because that feedback loop from head motion to proper parallax is what creates strong presence in VR today. And I believe that that feedback loop from motor control to haptics can be equally powerful. So I don't have a four-year prediction for haptic hands, but I'll make the farthest out prediction I've ever made and say that I believe that we'll have useful haptic hands in some form within 10 years. For ergonomics, my primary prediction was untethered headsets, but I also predicted greater comfort overall. This is an area in which the AR-VR connection really shines. The reason is that, in my opinion, in order to be successful, AR glasses have to be socially acceptable, weigh no more than about 70 grams, and dissipate no more than roughly 500 milliwatts on your head. Compared to that, VR ergonomics are a piece of cake. Applying AR technology to VR, especially display, silicon, audio, and computer vision, will make it genuinely possible to build something like the visor I showed you earlier. There's also another aspect of AR that will help to enable a hyper-comfortable visor four years from now, and that's a two-part architecture. Given the thermal and weight constraints, it's not feasible to get enough compute into a pair of socially acceptable glasses to enable truly useful AR. So AR glasses will have to be linked to a companion device, either a phone or a puck, that has most of the battery and compute. VR can similarly link the headset to a companion device, and that will reduce the weight on the head drastically, vastly improving comfort and overall form factor. Better yet, VR headsets could link to the companion device wirelessly, giving you complete freedom of motion. Of course, freedom of motion in VR comes with the challenge of moving around safely, and here we come to computer vision and mixed reality. That is, freely mixing the real and virtual worlds by reconstructing the real world and bringing desired parts of it into VR. Let's look at an example of reconstruction. First, the space needs to be scanned. This can be done manually, but can also be done automatically as a person wearing a headset moves around a space, as you see here. As the headset moves, the sensors sweep around the space, cumulatively building up a model of it over time. Once the space is captured, the model can be pulled into VR and played back, mapped to the real world. It can also be broken down into its major parts. And it can be reskinned. <laughs> Basically, at this point, real and virtual can be intermixed however you want. So that was pretty cool, but it was obviously a research video with plenty of artifacts. Can reconstruction get good enough to be really compelling? Well, here's a picture of a real apartment. Now, here's a reconstruction of that apartment done with consumer-grade sensors. Every time I see this, I'm astonished at how realistic it looks. It's easy to see how this level of reconstruction will enable virtual teleportation and powerful mixed reality. As we saw, a model of this detail and complexity takes time to construct. Instant real-time capture and reconstruction of the real world is also possible. It won't be as complete and polished, but will let you move around safely, interact with real objects, and mix real with virtual effectively. And that will be here within four years as well. Overall, computer vision capabilities are advancing rapidly, and I'm happy to stick with my prediction of high-quality mixed reality within four years. Now, mixed reality has implications beyond just expanding the range of VR experiences. Once we have good mixed reality, VR and AR suddenly have a great deal in common. For social reasons, you're probably not going to be walking around in public wearing a VR visor any time in the near future. But otherwise, what difference does it make whether the photons showing you the real world come from the real world or from a display? In fact, mixed reality in VR is inherently more powerful than AR glasses because there's full control of every pixel rather than additive blending. VR can also provide a richer experience than AR because the display doesn't have to be see-through, the form factor is much less constrained, and it doesn't have to run off of a battery for an entire day. So the truth is that VR is not only where mixed reality will first be genuinely useful, it will also be the best mixed reality for a long time. AR's advantage, on the other hand, is that it will make mixed reality available all day, anywhere you go. But both of them will be mixed reality platforms with a great deal in common. This commonality leads to some important conclusions. 
if both VR and AR let you mix real and virtual, why would they have different user interfaces? Sure, they would use different controllers in different situations, but they should ultimately use the same underlying interface tailored to specific uses. Similarly, they should have the same developer environment and tools, and apps should generally work seamlessly across both, although some will obviously be better or more useful on one platform than the other. So VR and AR should converge in many ways over the next decade. And finally, we come to my last prediction, virtual humans. Truly lifelike, real-time rep virtual representations of real people, which I didn't think would land within the five-year horizon. That may still prove to be right, but this may be another case where I was insufficiently ambitious, because the rate of change is accelerating here, too. Consider the face tracking video I showed two years ago. Now contrast that with this. A good morrow to you, my boy. It's healthier to cook without sugar. Thank you, she said. It's hard to believe, off. but one of those is a reconstruction, video. not a video. Approach Can you tell which? Statuesque composure. The one on the right you, is the reconstruction. If you look closely enough, there are imperfections in the neck, you, the hair, the eyes, and the mouth. But it's impressively close to the real thing. Thank you, she said, dusting herself off. George is paranoid about a few This is a novel machine learning-based approach we call codec statues. avatars. And while it's still in an early stage, if it could be made to work for everyone and included bodies and hands, it would revolutionize how we communicate and collaborate. Put it together with mixed reality, and where you live would no longer have to be tied to where you work. You could visit, really visit, with your family, even if you lived thousands of miles away. And of course, it would enable by far the best multiplayer games ever made. So I'm not betting on having convincingly human avatars within four years, but I'm no longer betting against it either. What's particularly interesting to me about the possibility of truly convincing virtual humans in the near future is that it is the last piece of the one thing I personally most want from VR. As I said two years ago, I would love to have a virtual workspace. A VR environment that you could configure any way you wanted, with virtual screens, holograms, whiteboards, and whatever, then switch between configurations instantly. That's the most productive solo work environment I can imagine. And then, if we add virtual humans, it would become an amazingly productive collaborative environment as well. If all of my four-year predictions come true, and virtual humans also lands, then a virtual workspace that replaces personal computers is a done deal. The only thing that that VR system would lack is true haptic hands, and that may well show up a few years later. Now, imagine that you have that powerful virtual workspace, and then AR glasses come along and let you seamlessly access that same workspace no matter where you are. True, the experience won't be as good, but you'll be able to do it anywhere, in a cafe, in a meeting, in an airport, wherever you want. You'll have the best workspace in the world when you're at your desk in VR, and you'll be able to access a lower fidelity version of the same workspace anytime, anywhere in AR. That's a future I look forward to with great anticipation and one that I expect to see within the next decade. And with that, we've come to the end of my predictions. The bottom line is that things are pretty much on track. True, it will be a year longer than I thought before most of this lands, but on the other hand, some important areas are advancing faster and farther than I anticipated, so I think that's a fair trade. Four years from now, VR is going to jump to the next level, and that's just the start. Every area will continue to improve, and virtual humans and likely haptic hands will be along before too long. In short, as far as I can see, and I can see pretty far, the future of VR couldn't be brighter. We, all of us gathered together today, both physically present and in VR, are quite literally creating the future. Our work is going to have a huge impact on how people live 10, 20, 50 years from now. Think of how much the world we live in has been shaped by Xerox Park and everything that followed. What we're collectively doing now will shape the future even more powerfully. A technology wave like this comes along only once every few decades and we are all unbelievably fortunate to be here for the beginning of this one. We're positioned to connect the world in ways far beyond anything that's ever existed before, and to make people more productive and their lives more fun while we're at it. 